Good day to you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour, the Day of Atonement. That's what we're going to talk about probably for this lecture and the next. The laws and the feast were basically uh, shadows, schoolmasters of that that would be. And many times, as far as atonement, Naturally, we have atonement in the New Testament, and we have atonement through Christ. But many times, without looking at the old method of atonement, which was simply a schoolmaster teaching you how to accept and appreciate the final atonement, let's say, of the New Testament, uh, it gives you a picture by utilizing things man can see to act out, if you would, the forgiveness of sins. You actually have objects, animals, people that act out atonement. Therefore, naturally, you have thus um, uh, visual aids. God ha was an, is an excellent teacher. And by using these visual aids, it gives you a picture of that that we now, through faith, not seeing, but hearing, and gives you a foundation for that, to know what it is that not seeing our faith, which brings about forgiveness and atonement, brings to pass. So, it does one well to look back into the past and follow these examples, learn of these examples, rather, whereby we can better understand our Father's emotions toward us. You can see a great deal of his emotions in the old schoolmaster, which is to say the Torah. Now, I want to start with you, if I may, by saying why did the Day of Atonement come to pass? And naturally, the, the simplest answer is because men need atonement for sin because they're all a bunch of sinners. We all fall short. What actually brought it to pass I find the thing very interesting that Aaron's two eldest son, two oldest sons, actually were caretakers of the altar, that's to say, to fire the altar of God on which the offerings were offered. And as you well know, they got to horsing around and got a little late one day. I'm, I'm going to just start with the. Uh, with Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where you have the actual recording, and then we'll go into atonement. Hang on, you'll understand why I'm doing this in a moment. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, and it reads, And Nadab, that in the Hebrew tongue that means liberal. You may know a liberal in your life. And if I hear, uh, God is my father, the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before God, before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Verse 2, And they went out, and there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. This is to say shortcuts to religion. In other words, they didn't have handy at that time uh, coals from the altar, so they probably just uh, grabbed a little fire from uh, maybe a buffalo chip fire or something going here to get the job done. Well, God doesn't appreciate that. That that he says is holy is holy, and that that he says is not holy is not holy. Do not ever try to make your love and worship to our Father a thing of convenience. Are you going to make him angry? It must be real, and it must be from the heart. This was especially serious in as much as the firstborn of Aaron, and Aaron being the father, if you would, of the Levitical priesthood, it was their obligation as ministers and teachers to set an example. God expects more from ministers, teachers, pastors, and so forth in that example. I would caution at the same time, never follow a man, this man or any other man, or look to that man for perfection, 
or you're going to be hurt. You're going to be disappointed. But rather look to Christ, our true teacher. Uh, and uh, keep your mind off the under-secretaries, the under-teachers of Christ. And keep your eye on him, and you'll never be hurt or disappointed. Okay, let's turn then, if we may, to the 16th chapter of Leviticus as we get into this day of atonement. Chapter 16, And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. Why, why do I read that? Because I feel that this was the stroke or the straw, the last straw that caused God to put in the Day of Atonement. Lord only knows we needed it if a priesthood itself had slipped to the point that they would utilize strange fire. Don't ever offer something that is terminated strange fire to your father. Let it be the real thing or don't do anything at all. All right, that's from the heart. I think this is what caused the Day of Atonement to be established. That's what I'm saying. Many would differ with that, be that as it may. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, wherein the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. In other words, this would be, tell him not to go into the Holy of Holies, even though he is the chief priest. But this one time a year, just don't go marching in there, or he's going to die. And there are conditions affixed to this. Verse 3, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Now, naturally, these were blood rituals and offerings, and they're no longer in existence, but you must learn from them. Listen, why should he bring these? For he shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. The same as in the New Testament, for atonement, you baptize yourself. You wash yourself. Meaning that you believe that he that atones went into the grave, the tomb, and rose. And note, specifically, these were all linen garments. God wants kind after kind. Don't mix the clothing, this being holy clothing. The ultimate reason being what? In the New Testament, the righteous linen, in the spiritual sense that we wear, you see this so that you can understand that that is future, that you can see it, and a better uh, touch it, if you would, in your mind. That your righteous acts, we, they are the fiber that weaves the holy linen that you wear in the eternity. All right? That, that is, a, is, a, is a very necessary piece of knowledge to settle the dispute between grace and faith, all right? There is no dispute between grace and faith uh, when you understand righteous acts being the fiber that weaves uh, the linen garment that is holy. You see what I mean by being a schoolmaster? These things all had a purpose. Take your time and understand, and you will better see that that we have now, which we'll discuss in the next lecture, verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats. In other words, they will belong to the membership. He will take these two goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Six, why? Listen, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. 
In other words, that priest had better get his own act together before he steps into that holy of holies, or he's going to die. So the atonement, this setting in place, the day of atonement. Let's say what, the atonement usually happened on the month of Tisha, which is the seventh month on the tenth day, five days before the Feast of Tabernacles, so that you can put this together in your mind. Therefore, inasmuch as everyone's sins were atoned for, or forgiven, then we started each year that time, at that time of the year, the Feast of Tabernacles, with all sins having been uh, driven away. In what manner? Listen, there were many customs and traditions that have been passed down as an example that they would soon, with all this linen, put little bells on his shoes because as long as he was moving about and you could hear the bells, they knew God hadn't struck him down dead, that he was still in there because certainly no one else would dare go in. Okay, verse 7, let's get into the Day of Atonement. And he shall take the two goats, important, the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Eight, and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot for the Lord, that's to say one for Yahweh in the Hebrew, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now, everybody, I suppose, it's human nature that you, if you're not careful, you start looking for scapegoats. It's a very common thing that it, it happens with children, if you notice. One child says, I didn't do it, he did it. You know, you always look for little brother or little sister or somebody else to find that scapegoat. Well, in a sense, this is for adults. Not in a sense, it was for adults. A scapegoat for what? This, this word scapegoat, I think in the Hebrew, says a little more, as is it, which means a goat of departing. Meaning, by this goat of departing, in the um, ramifications of, of um, a linguist, probably by the time all was said and done and you take it through all the cultures, represents the devil, all right? Represents Satan himself. One representing God, the other Satan. Why? Well, uh, goats are hairy, and many people that were named in after Esau, his name uh, meant he was hairy. So... Uh, it was related to him. Therefore, it would be a goat skin that Jacob would put over his arm to symbolize Esau. So here we have this goat of departing that was usually used as a scapegoat, meaning to put the sins of the world on, and we'll see what was to be done with him then. All right? So, scapegoat, goat of departure, we'll call him. Verse 9. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. In other words, you're going to kill that goat that the Lord's lot falls upon. There's much tradition in this also. For example, if um, the lot uh, falls on the right or the left, there would be more sin in that year and so on and so forth, which, um, of course, is not uh, biblical. But there's just a great deal with it. Uh, perhaps I digress in saying that. That the point is, is God's name upon that lot is killed and offered as a sacrifice. It doesn't take too much of a mind to put together that we're talking about Christ here in as much as Yahweh is upon the name of that good and that it would be sacrificed. Ultimately, looking forward to that time when Christ himself would be offered. You see the symbology in this, but it's something that you can actually see. Okay? Now, verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, this goat of departure, 
shall be presented alive. You don't kill that one. Alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Yes, the same wilderness that um, that uh, Satan tempted Christ in. The wilderness being the world. The same as Christ himself would not kill the evil spirits in the man by sending them back where they came from, but allowing them to go into the swine, into the world, and then giving his children, his followers, the power and authority to control that that is evil by ordering it back or out or whatever you so decree. Verse 11, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. In other words, to get his own act together for his own sins before he even comes close to the Holy of Holies. Verse 12, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it into the veil. In other words, here we see not, not strange fire, but the real fire. You know, this is alluded to, in a sense, in Revelation chapter 8, beginning about with verse 4, where it speaks there in the turn, in just prior to the beginning of the millennium, that the angel shall take coals from the altar of God and put them on the incense, cast them to the earth. Yes, the Satan will be cast, but that Within this incense and these coals from the altar were all your prayers. God maintains and holds those prayers. He doesn't forget. It's called the prayers of the saints. I think I'll turn there real quickly and just uh, cover that for you so that you have it fresh in mind, and perhaps it will help us to understand. We're studying history and events that God gave um, uh that should be done, whereby we can get a better picture of that that we do through faith today. Okay. Um, verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the altar, golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke and the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And that begins uh, the action just prior to the millennium. So you see, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what I want you to grasp from this. And by going into these the teachers, the teachings, the schoolmaster, we find that we have a clear and a more appreciative, loving respect for our Father. Okay, now back to Leviticus 16, verse 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he died not. In other words, that his sins be forgiven to the point that he died not by being in the presence of God, which is to say, into the Holy of Holies. Verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Now, eastward is that direction that is an example that uh, that uh, should always be faced at that time. And of course, the mercy seat being the seat, if you would, at the position of Messiah. 
That's why Satan, as it is written in Ezekiel 28, wanted that seat. And as sure as on that mercy seat, there were two cherubims. I feel that those two cherubims symbolized he that was um, uh, the one on the right, the, the Messiah that would take the chair, and the other, that cherubim that fell and was cast from heaven. That's why Moses would make a likeness of that, whereby you could see it with your own eyes. And of course, to sprinkle, uh, to, 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 um, sprinkle with the, thing, with his finger seven times. Seven in biblical numerics means spiritual completeness until the sin was completely accepted as atoned, gone, atoned for, 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. This is the one that had the name Yahweh upon it and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, which would symbolize the blood of Christ on the altar, the cross. To do away with sin seven times, meaning simply complete. When you repent, ultimately, we'll get in that in the next lecture, but I want you to see this very clearly because I will be alluding to it again. 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. In other words, it would seem, quite frankly, I'll just put it this way, it would seem that they fell so short that God had to arrange this one day of the year that they could have all their sins atoned for, for him to even associate with them. It was that bad. 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. In other words, that atonement had to be made starting right here, right with Aaron, right with the priest. It would seem that many priests today might forget that, ministers, teachers, pastors. You see, unfortunately, it would seem that some think they don't have sin. I mean, after all, they're to be reverend, aren't they? The revolving rev is perfect and has no sin, thus needing no atonement. I jest in a way, but the gesture can be taken very seriously in many occasions because some allow that ego um, role of importance to hold over the head of the congregation rather than as Aaron to admit his own sins privately to God and ask for that atonement. It's very necessary to have the blessings of God. Verse 18. And he shall go out in, unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Even this altar, horns symbolize power. There was one on each corner. And by touching them with the a Yahweh goat, I will call him, the goat that the lot of God fell upon. For you see, for the remissions of sin, at this time there had to be shedding of blood. It hasn't changed. 
And that's why Christ's blood is so very, very important for one in all times. Verse 19. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel to set it apart, to bring it to that point, seven being spiritual completeness of spiritual completeness. Verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Now here we have, we have taken the goat that God's lot fell upon and it was sacrificed even as Christ was crucified and sacrificed on the cross. Didn't have to. But it was part of God's ultimate plan, and this in itself, the Day of Atonement, looks forward to and is part of God's plan leading to the sacrifice of sacrifices. And we see within that that he needs now the goat of departure, meaning that the sins and atonements will depart with he brings the live goat. Um, verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess, I repeat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and of all their transgressions and all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat. Now, now, that's quite a load for that goat to carry, right? Uh, symbolically speaking, even. And shall send him away by the hand of a fit man. I repeat, a fit man unto the wilderness. Um, um, and uh, we see within this... Um, a man, if you would, of opportunity. A fit man, meaning one that was capable of carrying it out. Let's go one more verse. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Uh, so here, here we have the goat of separation, this goat uh, and the land that was separated. Why? Nature can handle those sins, symbolically speaking. Nature has a way of cleansing itself. You can pollute water and let it run through sand not very many feet, and it's clean water again. God created this earth whereby... It would regenerate itself. It would refurbish itself, probably better said, um, by plant life, by the very texture of the soils, by the wilderness. That is to say that that man has not touched. But also, this um, goat who symbolizes, if you would, Satan, because that's where the... Understand this, and don't miss this point, is that Satan is the one that the sin belongs upon, because he started it. He started it in the first earth age. And many people will allow him, and even as he wanders in the wilderness, the world, in the spirit even now, to come into his home and cause all kinds of damage to the minds of your family, yourself. Revisiting, if you would, when, as you will learn in the next part of this lecture, the following lecture, you don't have to put up with that stuff. But here we have God taking the sins and driving them into the wilderness. I suppose that one equation you should draw from that and something that's very obvious is in this case as he did not order 
that sin, that uh, demonic uh, possession of the man, back where it came from, but into the swine. So here he takes all the sins and loosens them back into the world. Even though the atonement is made because of sacrifice, God's wonderful, able forgiveness that he set up upon this that would continue on year after year after year until this sacrifice would be taken away. And as was the daily oblation, daily sacrifice, so was this sacrifice, this special feast, this special set-aside day. It was called a high day, and everyone was to participate because it was the atonement or the day of atonement, the day that all sins were forgiven and that a clean, fresh start began. Five days, what, what is five? You see, everything in God's plan has a purpose and a reason. Five days before the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, Sukkot, then five, naturally, biblically, is the number of grace. And it is grace itself that gives you that booth, Sukkot, which is to say a place of residence uh, with a clean start as it was the first time out of Egypt. The Day of Atonement. It's a precious day. And here we see from the schoolmaster, we see rather than, as you do today, pray, repent, and your sins are forgiven. Then if you must, go back to the schoolmaster and picture a fit man with all your sins piled upon the head, not the foot, but the head of this goat, which is called in the Hebrew tongue the goat of departure, meaning they're going to leave. They're going to separate and see your sins taken away. Well, he does not give Christians that um, visual sight of sins departing. But in knowing the schoolmaster that was set up whereby you could visualize it on the head of that goat as a good and fit man took that goat and the sin away, that you're clean, that you're forgiven. Because certainly, if there was ever a fit man to take your sins away, it would be naturally the only man in the flesh that was ever perfect and was in all in all the only fit man which is to say Christ taking your sins away into the wilderness the world and saying I don't want to hear about them again they're gone so you see though Christ is our atonement today, which we will pick up in the next lecture. We have this schoolmaster whereby you can visually, with these visual aids, see symbolically what actually happens in your life today when you repent and when you pay with love. You see, he doesn't want to burn offering from you today. You might as well get this straight in your mind. If your prayers aren't being answered, this could be one of the reasons. He doesn't want to burn offering. He wants your repentance, your repent, your having repented, and and loving him enough to know he's the fit man is taking that sin away from you and love him for it. So many people would seem to repent and say, all right, good buddy. I appreciate you getting rid of it for me. Goodbye. I'll see you later. Do you realize that? So it seems that's the way a lot of people do it. Thank you for taking my sins, Lord. Goodbye. Next time I need you, I'll call you. Don't call me. 
there's no love showing. <laughs> and I assure you there are no sins forgiven. I use that as an analogy to show you the more in-depth action, and there is action, behind the forgiveness of sins. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, which is the easiest to say? You are healed or your sins are forgiven? Where is the action? Did you see it? No, you didn't. But here you can see it in the schoolmaster. Well, well, what do you mean? You, you just repent and he forgives it and that's all there is to it. Where's the action? My friend, it happened approximately 33 A.D. There was a lot of action. There was a trial. There was another trial. There were thorns. There was blood that was down the forehead from those thorns. There were smears, spit from the sides, ridicule, pronouncement of death, and a long trek up that path to Golgotha. And then the sound of the hammer, as the nails were driven, and he was placed on that cross, and it was lifted, and it sunk into that hole made therefore, and he died on that cross. That's where the action is. And that's why don't you ever dare say, thank you, I'll see you again. You love him for having done this for you. You see, there was enough action for one and all times that he is the royalty that earned the right, being the only fit man that can say, I love you in return, and your sins are forgiven. He did that for you. Don't ever forget to love him for it. Respect him, honor him, praise him, for he is your kinsman, Redeemer is your nearest kin, and he's the one that put forth the action, pain and all, ridicule and all, shame and all, cursing and all, that fell upon him. He didn't waver, no flip-flop, straight on, because he loves you. A little love in return is not asking too much. Don't you love him? That's why we have the schoolmaster. It's to take us back to see whereby we can better understand. We'll pick this subject up for the next lecture. I hope you have felt the emotion of your father from it in the Holy Spirit that you can more appreciate the scapegoat. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. We're going to pick up again on the Day of Atonement. It fascinates me when we are allowed, when we can use the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the teachings, the schoolmaster, to help us better understand the fulfillment thereof, with it only being a shadow, when we remove that shadow and hit the actual thing, then it becomes a lot clearer. As a matter of fact, uh, just a real quick short recap. In the last um, lecture, we covered the book of Exodus, where Leviticus, rather, chapter 16 especially, where the Day of Atonement was set in motion by our Father through Moses, that the two goats were brought blessed, the lots cast, they fell on one. One was named Yahweh, or put Yahweh's name on him. And the other, the scapegoat, or uh, the name can't even imply in some, uh, to some linguist would say, yes, it's even symbolic of Satan, and probably is, true enough. But the lot that fell on the Yahweh goat, he was slain. 
and his blood was placed on the horn of the altar, meaning power. But the other goat, which called the scapegoat, all the sins of both the priest and the people were poured upon the head of this goat, and a certain man took a fit man, a specific man, one that was able, took the goat with all the sins into the wilderness and released him, which was symbolic of what? The fact that Christ would be slain for the atonement, uh, that is to say the covering, or, uh, or having paid the price for all of our sins in his blood, no longer needing that scapegoat that Christ himself took our sins on, and not only were they re-released into the world, but in Christ's case, they're forgotten, they're erased. That's to say, even the sins even erased from the book of life. And that's important to you, that on Judgment Day, that you have a nice clean uh, sheet there where your name is posted in that book of life. So, now let's go to the New Testament in this atonement. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, which specifically addresses the same thing only under the new covenant. Let's get into it. Verse chapter 9, verse 1, and it reads, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances, or you could say ceremonies, of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. That that was holy even was was worldly, if you would. And and this wouldn't do, but it was our school teacher. We could see the whole enactment of God's willingness to forgive our sins within that. Verse two. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbreads which is called the sanctuary, the holy place, again, verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, that's to say the holy of holies, that only the chief priest could go into, and then only once each year, what was within that, verse 4, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, overlaid with round uh, about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. That is to say, the Ten Commandments. In this ark, therein the holy of the holies, all those things, you know, I could we could talk for a long time on these things and what each one meant to us. The manna, that's angel's food. When there was nothing else, no other way, people would have starved except our Father provided the manna, this food, and sustained our people as they wandered in that desert, in that rod of Aaron's, which is uh, Aaron. Uh, appointed as the chief priest of all times, head of the the uh, Levitical priesthood, then that rod that budded, meaning that that would bud again, that it would continue on, and in a sense it did, and as much as Lazarus in the Greek, both the parable and the Lazarus that was raised from the dead is the equivalent of the Hebrew Eleazar, which was the name of the third son of Aaron that budded and became the the head priest, after the two wicked sons, the elders, playing with strange fire on the very altar of God, were killed by God. But the truth continued on. It budded forth, and it will always bud forth. It will always come forth because the word itself is entailed therein. Verse 5. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, protecting it of which we cannot now speak particularly. That's, we can't go into detail about that. I can't share the whole thing with you at this time. Um, impossible to go into the details, as, as probably I've already shown in part an example of that. We could talk from now on 
on these particular things, such as the cherubims that shadow. This is why Satan himself was called the cherubim, and he was a cherubim created by God, as is written in Ezekiel chapter 28, the king of Tyre at the altar of God being Satan, that he was the cherub that covereth. Covereth what? The mercy seat. Boy, did he go bad. Verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, prepared for that purpose, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. What does that mean? Well, he did those things which Aaron was instructed by the living God in Leviticus uh, 16 concerning atonement, the arrangement of worship, the sequence set forth in the forgiving first, uh, of having forgiveness first for his own sins, that is to say the priest, and then the people's. And then, if it wasn't done properly, he would die, just as Aaron's older two sons had died. Verse 7. I do not wish to imply that they died in the Holy of Holies. They didn't make it that far. Verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone. Behind that second veil, only the high priest alone, once every year. Not without blood which he offered for himself his own sins and for the errors of the people, for the sins of the people. You know what blood he had. He had the blood of the one goat and the bullet for himself. Verse 8, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, this uh, signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not, repeat, not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. And you must remember, what kind of tabernacle do we have now? It is ironic that Christ's own words of saying, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days, which meant he, his body became that temple. And, and when he was crucified and rose in three days, three and a half days, then the true temple, the true tabernacle, the tabernacle that is is sincerely able to atone, to take away sin, uh, was built in the body of Christ, in the many-membered body of Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit signifying, teaching us through those old methods, those old ordinances, the real significance to Christ forgetting our sins. And as I was going to say, it is ironic that at the trial of Jesus Christ, when he was delivered up, one of the accusations made against him was that he claimed he could rebuild the temple in three days. Boy, did they find out. Verse 9. Which was a figure, this was a, um, a semblance for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Uh, only Christ through the Holy Spirit can touch our conscience. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and we within that Spirit. And He can touch the conscience. He knows our minds. He knows when we're sincere and He knows when we're playing church. That is to say, faking things. You don't con the Holy Spirit. You don't con God. Verse 10. Uh, let, let, me, let me further state. Those things did not um, signify the Savior that would come, who would pay the price for our sin with his blood, whereby indeed the sin was washed away, never to be heard of by him again, forgotten, totally clean, and made perfect for that moment. Though in the flesh we always fall short, unfortunately. Verse 10. 
which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and ceremonial ordinances, uh, imposed on them until, I repeat, until the time of reformation, that's to say the reformation, or you might say the new order, the new order of things. And naturally on the cross, that new order came into full effect. And then man in his imperfection, uh, we find Solon's there atonement, made at one moment with God. Verse 11. But Christ, being come an high priest, after what? After the order of Melchizedek. Of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Let's just say the body of Christ. Uh, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building, but the true, lasting, wonderful building, that body that <clears throat> would be our kinsman redeemer and still is, and, and is certainly today. Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. That, that couldn't do it, friend. It was only a school teacher. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, I repeat, eternal redemption for us. In other words, there was none of this killing the goats over and over and over and the so on and so forth and sprinkling the blood here and there for one and all times. Christ's blood was able to bring about the redemption eternally for all mankind that would believe upon him, that would serve him. But how much we learn by taking a look at the old schoolmaster in detail, the ordinances that went forth that symbolized what Christ would do for us. You see, I felt uncomfortable when the thought first struck my mind a moment ago to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that the priest, when he came, the chief priest such of the Levitical priesthood, when he came to the place of the altar where the animal was slain, he made a big show, you know, taking the life of the animal, bleeding it, the basin. But you see, our Savior, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, when he came, it was his blood that was shed. And that makes your sins being forgiven a very serious thing. For he loved you that much that he did not act the part of regret or of whimper and of lying, but he did it for you willingly. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, if, if this would do it, symbolically, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, he was perfect, to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That verse is so very important. So very important that he would give himself one time that there would be no more dead works of what? Dead animals in a ritual. Sacrifice to God. God didn't want the dead animal. He wanted your love. 
And that was, that was a way of signifying his desire of wanting your love because he himself took the place on the altar of the animal. That is to say, he gave his life, shed his blood, showing his love for you, that he cared that much. That's a lot. Now, you don't have to do those dead works for God anymore. That is to say, stuff that only lasted a year, and it was, you know, you kept slipping by the wayside and everything. But now you serve the living God. And many say, well, and all you have to do is believe. No, that's not what it said. You misunderstood. And unfortunately, due to many teachings in this world today, Many people are being robbed of their eternal blessings because of weak teachers. That is to say, teachers that have to make it so easy or sound so easy. This is what's in their mind. That it is easy to be saved and to be a Christian and to serve God. But people are so basically lazy, many of them sluggards, that they would just as soon be like the old grasshopper, grab what you can, don't store up, you know, just say, I'm a Christian. And we come back to this business of faith versus works. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to do those old dead works anymore. That's what they would say concerning this scripture. But is that really what it says to you? Do you know what it says to me? It says, purge, clean your conscience, or get out of your mind from dead works. That means the Old Testament way of atonement. Two, to do what? There's a second part to this. This is the new part. To serve the living God. Hey, friend, do you know what that word serve is in the Greek? Do you think it isn't work? It is to stop working for the dead and begin working, 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 I repeat, working service to serve. The word in the Greek will even stand a translation of menial, labor serving the living God. Because though Christ shed his blood, he rose. Uh, the ta tabernacle was re rebuilt in three days, three and a half days. He raised, having defeated Satan, and sits at the right hand of the living God. So you see, again, you can you can get in heaven just by believing and with no works. This makes a very lazy, worthless Christian, though. With your righteous acts being made up of your material, you show me a man that says, I'm judged by faith alone and never does any work, and I'll show you a man that his belly button is showing in heaven. Because he's going to have no garment. He's going to be standing there like an overstuffed goose with zilch to put on. But I made it to heaven. Yeah, you naked jaybird. You made it to heaven, but why don't you get off out of sight somewhere where we don't have to look at you? Because your works are your reward. Your work is the only thing that you can take with you, and it is, I know this is going to sound strange to some, but it is true. Why does it sound strange? Because of that overstuffed naked duck that teaches you that all you have to do is have faith. Well, it's true. Faith will get you in heaven, but you're naked. I don't want to have to look at you. I hope they have a special place way off for those that have no clothing. Just, I'd rather not be around them. To serve, to work. Do the works of the living God. Don't let some don't let someone rob you just because it sounds easy. I don't have to do anything. Well, hey, I'll take them up on that. 
if that's what you think, you're not, you probably won't even make it. Hey, I'm not, I'm not so hard up for members that I'm going to under teach or undersell the truth to draw people into worshiping God. If you're lazy, until you can shape yourself up, I would just as soon not have you. You go ahead to the old ugly duck neck, the old ugly naked duckling over there and get in his group because you'll all be naked together. No works. But we have faith. Well, that's wonderful. Naked ducks ought to have faith. That's all they're going to have. God loves you. I'll agree to that. And I hope that all of you understand that this is symbolic, but it is very scriptural, and the book of Revelation states that you will be naked without works. All I'm saying is don't let some man rob you. And so, well, we might as well say another word on that. We'll take a minute. What does it mean then works? Well, to plant a seed, to share the good news. Uh, to support a ministry. Do you realize that in supporting a ministry, as an example, you that make this possible, that you receive the same reward that I do from this ministry? I'm nothing special. I don't do as much as a lot of you do. Because all I do is reiterate the Word of God truthfully and honestly as best I can with the help of the Holy Spirit to discern the parables and those things that are hidden from those that are not supposed to see, that's it. And many of you make the very station that you're watching possible, or satellite, whatever you may be watching, whereby millions can share in the Word of God. And what a reward. That's works, my friend. And it may be just being a faith warrior is having enough faith that you exercise that faith in intercessory prayer. Those are jewels in your crown. Those are works. And they are necessary to lay your reward up for you. If you don't believe that your works are the only thing you can take with you, you read the 14th chapter of Revelation and you'll find out. Uh, I would say the verse 13 or 14 comes to mind. 10, read 10 through 14. You'll find it. Your works can go with you. Now, where did I get to here? Verse 15, let's, uh, or was I making comment? Yes. And for this cause, it's for this reason, he is the mediator. Because he died once for sin for eternity, for this reason he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, that's to say sins, that were under the first testament, that were put on the goat's head, they which are called, my children which are called, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. I, I like the word call there. God has a way of calling those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. And all those that by adoption or simply by enjoying hearing God's word taught receive a blessing from it. That he became the testament. That is to say, he became he that put the testament Call it a will if you have to, in effect. In other words, a man writes a will or a covenant would be better, a contract. And as to what will happen after his death. And until that man dies, no one inherits anything necessarily. Got the picture? Hang on, let's go. 16. For where a testament or a contractor will is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You've got to die before that will takes effect. It's initiated. That's why that Christ would say, go but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Before he died on the cross uh, in the flesh, 
that rose on the third day and created the tabernacle that was the redemption and became the mediator for any, for all peoples everywhere. It was placed, the will was opened uh, in Satan's face. Uh, and the promises poured forth for those that were familiar with the word of God, that would claim it. 17. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. It just sits in a box, lock box. In actuality, in many cases, just sits there. And that farm is not worth anything as long as that man lives. 18. We're up on neither the first testament, that's the goat smearing, was dedicated or it did not purify without blood. Even that, one of those goats had to die. Naturally, it was the one that was symbolic of Christ. And the sins were placed on the other and it was released into the wilderness and removed from the people. Even then, blood had to be shed for it to be of effect. That's God's contract in Leviticus 16 for the Day of Atonement. Uh, you being having your sins atoned for. 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, and, scar and scarlet wool and hyssop, make a mental note, hyssop, and sprinkle both the book and all the people. Do you remember what happened on the cross? Do you think it was an accident? That hyssop was taken by one of the, the soldiers? And vinegar, which was a poor man's wine, the Roman soldiers drank it. That's what it was. It was fun and touched it to him, anointed his lips with it, to prick your mind into saying, whoa, isn't that fascinating that the very word of God, which is the book, was anointed on the cross, even with hyssop. 20, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you, or for you. He's made this for you. God divorced Israel. And until this one died, he was not free to remarry her. Got it? Think about it. 21. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. No remission of what? Sins. That's what he did for you, beloved. He shed his blood. Think for a moment. Who would you die for? 23. It is therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better to say more noble sacrifices than these goats going for for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands no no which are the figures of the true that means they were only symbolic of the true holy of holies what do you mean by that? Well, hang on a minute. He didn't enter in those that holy of holy made with hands, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. What? Don't you overread that. For us. He appears there. We've had the adversary there in God's face since the beginning of time. And when Christ died on the cross, released the prisoners took the right-hand seat on the very altar itself of God, throne of God, and sits there at the right hand of God for us as our mediator. 
In other words, he has God's attention. He's our kinsman redeemer. The holy of holies is no longer on earth. Once he entered the holy of holies at the very throne of God, the highest on earth, and stands there in the adversary's face, and he will sit there until all of his enemies are made his footstool. 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, once a year, over and over. As the high priest in, entereth uh, into the holy place every year with the blood of others, that's to say of animals, 26, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's what the Day of Atonement is all about, beloved. 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and only once, no reincarnation garbage, once. But after this, the judgment. 28. Listen. So Christ was off, once offered to bear the sins of many, and in, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, second advent, without sin unto salvation. He can look at you and you will not be in sin either because if you repent, he's at the right hand of God for you. He died for you and he is still for you at the right hand of God to keep Satan out of God's face in your case. Satan might say, did you, this is what repentance does. Let me just give you a little preview of what it really looks like inside the Holy of Holies. That's to say the Holy of Holies today that Christ is enjoined in with the Father with Satan's presence as the accuser allowed by Michael. What does it mean, accuser? To accuse you. When you sin, Satan sees that sin. And he can hardly stand it. He knows God is proud of you. He says, boy, wait till I put it in his face what I saw old Joe do. Joe repents. And Christ, sitting at the right hand of God, takes that sin and washes it. Satan comes to accuse. And Christ said, sorry, son. No way, Jose. Uh, that's uh, Maybe I shouldn't put it in quite that terms as much as I'm speaking of the Holy of Holies. But he puts it right back in Satan's face because Joe is perfect. He repented, claimed the blood, and Satan has no space, no edge. Because his arch enemy, Christ himself, paid the price that Satan doesn't have a leg to stand on. That, my friend, is a daily view into the Holy of Holies. As of today, as of A.D. 33, when Christ took that seat as our kinsman redeemer, I want to close this with the sixth verse of the next chapter, just to sum it up. You should read the whole tenth chapter, chapter 10, verse 6 of this great book of Hebrews, and it reads, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. God didn't enjoy that. He didn't enjoy that goat's blood. Seven. Then said I, lo, Christ speaking, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. It was God's plan. Not only did he come in the volume of the book, he is the book. He is the word of God, the living word of God. Eight. Above when he said, who said? Christ said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. That is to say, the old contract. It was the teacher. I didn't get any pleasure from that. What pleasure is God is your love. Return to him. That's what he wants, not burnt flesh. But this is why he sent his son. 
9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He took away that goat sacrifice and put in place the eternal order of redemption and atonement. Verse 10 to complete. By the which will we are sanctified, made clean, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's the day of atonement, my friend. But I assure you, it takes both the old will contract and the new to actually understand the window into the Holy of Holies. And we can walk right into that Holy of Holies. You mean into heaven? By Spirit, yes, for His Spirit is in us. For what happened on that day that Christ died on the cross? Exactly. Exactly. At that moment, the veil was rent, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. Why was the veil rent? So that you could come on in. So that you could walk in without shame, boldly, on repentance, into the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Father, and Yeshua. That's to say, Jesus. Christ. He died once to make that possible for you that any day, any hour, any time, anywhere, the new temple is the body of Christ, and if you're in Him, you're a part of it. The body. You can walk in and say, Hello, Father. I love you. And I appreciate your son that loved me enough, a sinner, that he shed his blood once for my terrible sins. I repent of them so that Satan cannot accuse myself or you that he has not a leg to stand on. Thank you for allowing me, a sinner, into the Holy of Holies, perfect after having repented. Before, listen to me. What was the shadow for? Before you approach the Holy of Holies, which is the presence of God, spiritually, the presence of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, before you approach, you had better cleanse yourself. The priest did. And the school teacher, what did he do? He offered something. What was it? The book. For his own personal sin. What am I saying? Repent. And come on in to the Holy of Holies. That way, you don't track up the threshold with your sins. Repent. And with the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit takes your hand and leads you across that threshold, 